Welcome to the Ecosystem of Relationships, a webinar put on by Heartmanity and Broken Ground. I'm Jennifer Williams, founder of Heartmanity and the Heartmanity Center. I've been a relationship strategist and emotional fitness trainer for over 20 years. I founded Heartmanity as a platform to help people create thriving relationships. And I'm Karine Irby, uh, and I'm the founder of Broken Ground, uh, and I'm an experienced gardener and permaculture practitioner. I have been teaching gardening and permaculture workshops to people here in my community in Bozeman, Montana, uh, for over six years, and I love teaching people and educating people about growing their own food and connecting uh, to natural systems. So why are we doing this? <clears throat> Corrine and I have known each other for several years, and we started seeing a lot of similarities between creating an ecosystem with our planet and a healthy one and that of relationships within people. And the challenges are similar, the concepts and principles are simple, are simple but profound and very difficult to execute. And we started really talking about what that means, and we thought it might be a really great springboard for you to understand how to apply the concepts of an ecosystem in your life. We love this cartoon. He didn't do anything, Gregory. This is a zoo. This is an example of our disconnection within our culture. Children are raised in grocery stores and they don't know enough about being connected to nature, often nature deprived. And so we're hoping that this helps you connect not only yourself personally to each other more and to nature, but also for our children. So what we want to talk about really is this whole idea of interconnectedness, bringing the idea of ecosystems and ecology uh, into our lives. So in nature, of course, everything is connected, right? Like this quote, nothing happens in living nature that is not in relation to the whole. Uh, we're a very reductionist society. Um, we've segregated a lot of things in our lives. And yet in nature, everything is connected and we are connected. Uh, to natural systems. So when we think about interconnectedness, what we're wanting to work towards, right, is building strong and healthy connections, not only on an ecological level, right, but within our communities. And we want people to remember that we are all connected to one another, uh, even though we can kind of live in our individual homes, um, uh, we still are all connected as a people and as a planet. And of course, um, we're seeing this right now, that how we treat each other and our environment matters, uh, and that each person and each organism is tied to many others. So what we want to do is look at the ecological system and understand that within uh, ecology, within natural systems, a lot of networks are being created between the plants, right? There's a lot of connections that are being created, and what we want to do is not only recognize those, but create those resilient networks within our communities, uh, between our friends and family, and between our neighborhoods, and also within the, the cities where we live. So ecology is concerned with the interrelationship of organisms and their environments. And that's true for us as people, it's true with us with nature, it's true with how we interact with life. So we're hoping that this webinar will give you some pieces to be able to better apply your own into your own life the ecology of a thriving ecosystem. So what gets in the way of taking care of ourselves and each other and of our planet? On the next page, there's a worksheet for you just to give some thought to this. For you personally, what is it? What are those top three reasons that get in the way of taking care of yourself, your family, your community, and the environment, whether that's the environment of your yard, of your home, or of your direct community. Well, please take some time now, and if you haven't already, download the, the handouts and the, the worksheet so that you can begin to jot down these ideas. And I think one of the reasons, you know, to get back to why um, we decided to do this, um, Jennifer, was, was basically seeing how is it, why is it that we've become so disconnected right. from our natural world? Absolutely. Why is it that we don't take care of our environment? Um, and and in, in so doing, also, why don't we take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? right? And so to kind of bring to light um, 
what some of those reasons are that get in your way. And one of the things that most people don't realize is that we can only connect to others and to our environment to the level we take care of ourselves and connect to our own hearts. And we often forget that and we push ourselves when we should be resting or we do things within our life that we're making ourselves do rather than wanting to do. And so one of the things that creates a thriving relationship is first a thriving relationship with ourselves. Self-awareness, modulation of our emotions, being able to get exercise and do those things that make us feel our best. And then at that point, we can be loving to each other, loving to our children and to our husbands and our wives and to our community. And we only have energy, really, for community when we take care of ourselves and our family. Right. I guess that gets a little bit back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, too. It does, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You can't can't fulfill anything if you're in survival. Right. Right. So these are ways that we've looked at. So we've taken ecological principles here. And we, uh, and I'm going to talk about um, how they're applied uh, to create a healthy ecosystem. And then Jennifer is going to talk about how you can apply these same principles uh, to create healthy relationships. So we're going to go through these five principles. Uh, principle one, observe and interact. Principle two, self-regulate and accept feedback. Principle three, integrate rather than segregate. Principle four, produce no waste. And principle five, respond to change. So we're going to go into a lot more detail about each of these principles. So the first one is observe and interact. What we put our attention on is what we see. Now this is so profound because if you think about it, it's not really what's happening in our lives. It's what we put our attention on and how we see it. And we have a lot of things that influence that, whether it's our stress, whether it is um, how well we're feeling that day, whether it's if we just yelled at our child or if it's um, our house is a wreck uh, because we haven't had time to clean it. There's a lot of things that are going on in our life, but it's what we put our attention on, both that creates the disconnect and the stress or whether it creates connection with each other in our environment. So on an ecological level, uh, what you're doing when you look at this principle of observe and interact is you are observing these natural systems. And I think both on an ecological level and a personal level, we're in such a highly stimulated environment, right? That's for sure. Right? (laughs) With our computers, our cell phones, all of this stuff that, that really makes you distracted a lot of the time. This ecological principle is basically about slowing down and taking some time and taking a moment. Um, In your yard or garden, for example, you'd be observing the patterns of what you see. Where does the rain collect? Where does the snow collect? Where are the leaves? Uh, Where does the wind come from? And you're so, you're understanding all those patterns and you're engaging with those patterns as a way in which to design your yard and garden. Uh, And of course, without this observation, uh, you're kind of acting blind, right? You can't design effective solutions if you don't know what you have already. So how does that relate to relationships? When we observe and interact, we take time for mindfulness. We take time to pause. We take time to slow everything down, to seek to understand another person and what we're feeling. And one of, uh, it's a big trend right now in mindfulness and meditation and um, the brain research has shown us now that to be mindful and to actually observe is what creates a interconnectedness and meaningful life. So whether you're at a party or having a picnic with friends or whether you're with your child or whether you're just alone and in solitude with nature, it is the observation that allows us to have mindful interaction with our environment and with each other. So how does it look to observe and interact when it comes to relationship? It's being attentive and honoring not only our own needs and rhythms individually, But that helps to create thriving relationships because if our needs are not met, then we literally move into competition with the needs of those around us. And we are now in survival mode and we are not thriving, we are surviving. And how we interact regularly will get conditioned and patterned. Whatever we do on a consistent, regular basis 
the brain will delegate into the unconscious and make automatic, just like on cruise control in your car. And at that point, it's much easier, it's much faster, it it's becomes the habit that's hard to break. And so we want to observe to bring it more mindful and make it more conscious and choose actually how we're interacting. Relationships need to be nurtured. It's very e easy in our stressful and very full lives to move into automatic in getting things done, checking something off of our to-do list. And it's just a fact that the quality of our relationships depends on our connection and nurturance. And that really ties back into, you know, nurturing a garden, oh, right? I'm pulling the that, weeds right. that are way right. out of control in my garden right now. So if you don't uh, nurture a garden, you won't get a yield. You won't get food from it. Um, it needs attention and it needs care. Um, so it comes back to that, that principle of natural systems. And you can't really nurture it, though, if you don't observe it, correct? Right. If you right. don't notice it, there's a bug that's destroying your cabbage yep. or, you know, the, the tomatoes aren't getting enough water. Yeah, absolutely. That makes, you know, if you're paying attention to it on a regular basis, if you're observing it daily, then you can notice pests or you can notice uh, weeds that come up or, and you can take care of those before they get out of control. Right, which is also true for relationships, and that is our fourth point, is identify the emotional deposits for each other and give consistently. We sometimes are so captivated by our own needs or our own agenda that we forget to really observe and pay attention to someone else. So when you know we make a comment that's a little harsh or mm -hmm. we forget, uh, make a commitment and we don't show up, we forget to realize the impact we have on each other. And those emotional deposits are like money in the bank. If, if your checking account's on zero and you spend some money, you're going to overdraw. Well, relationships are like that too. If we continue to take, we continue to reach out in a way that's not productive or not helpful or is hurtful even, then we start paying the price of that. Mm -hmm. So by observing the responses of those people in our lives, we can better respond ourselves in a mindful way to nurture, to engage at a place that's right for them, right for us, so that we can truly connect. And let's not fool ourselves. There is no connection to one another when we're angry or we're spent and we're totally exhausted. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to our first point of honoring ourselves and our needs and each other and our environment. That's great. So we have another worksheet for you. Again, uh, if you haven't downloaded these, you should go ahead and download them. Uh, what we want to do, these worksheets are intended to integrate the material that we're going through because there's a lot of information that we're uh, throwing at you right now. So, um, so this worksheet is all about that principle of observing and interacting. So in your life, you know, think about do you take time to observe or do you just react? to a situation. I think um, I'm certainly guilty of that. <laughs> no, we all are. <laughs> all the time. Sure. <laughs> and then again, on a personal level, are you aware of your thoughts, your emotions, desires, and how experiences affect you? I think again, our, our, our tendency is to push through mm -hmm. experiences right. rather than taking the time to figure out how those experiences have had an effect on us. Right, and without awareness you can't change anything. You right. can't improve, you can't become right. your best if you're just reacting, right? right? And reaction is always an unconscious response. Right. And then the third question, how do you interact socially? Do you honor yourself and those around you? Um, so a lot of this, again, you know, that obs observation piece that you bring to your yard and your garden is that observation observation peace and self-awareness that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and doesn't gardening really increase your self-awareness and how you interact with the garden? I found that sometimes the way we interact with our environment is exactly how we're interacting with people. Yes. Right? We yeah. tend to shut down or build walls. Mm -hmm. and so we forget about our garden for a week. Oh, yeah, I haven't watered. Right, right. right. That, that's, that's true, too, in terms of when I started do, uh, gardening, I had to really, uh, I came up against my whole perfectionist <laughs> tendency, yeah. right? You know, if something didn't work out, if, um, if those beets didn't germinate, or I didn't get the tomatoes that I wanted, then I would beat myself up about it. Mm -hmm. You know, again, that same pattern mm -hmm. that, that I had in my life doing other things was also reflected in how I gardened. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. But then it's a great, you know, in that way, too, it's a really good opportunity to to kind of tune into that and understand that you need to be patient with natural systems Mm -hmm. and therefore with yourself. Yes, and natural systems within ourselves, right? Right. Where there's those, you know, we're expanding. Sometimes we can't keep expanding. We have to pull in and relax and rest and integrate. Right. So go ahead and jot down your ideas and with those things that you want to reflect on right now. So the second principle is self-regulate and accept feedback. Um, and again, let's go back to this idea of ecology and how ecology is concerned with this interrelationship of organisms and their environments. If you don't self-regulate, right, and accept the feedback that you're receiving, then you can't continue to coexist uh, in a very sustainable way. And indeed, this is the feedback, you know, again, we are taking resources um, out of our, um, well, basically we're clear cutting, uh, we're using resources, and we're setting up a system that's very linear. We take the resources, we use them, and then we dump them in the landfill. Whereas uh, ecology teaches us and natural systems are very cyclical in nature. And the reason that they are able to continue those cycles um, are because there's a certain amount of self-regulation and feedback, right? We can't continue to expand and expand and expand. Right. Um, like you uh, mentioned, Jennifer, we have to also give back to a system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the feedback that we're receiving right now um, in terms of the climate changing, in terms of the ecological crises that we face, is one in which the planet is saying, okay, enough. Enough right? Mm. We have to be more sustainable. We have to understand that you can't take, 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 take without giving back in some way. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, technology can be such a source of connection, Mm -hmm. but it also can really deplete us. And one of the things that really shocked me was how we're depleting our soils because the technology of collecting, like say, potatoes within a field, they don't miss any but isn't it, isn't it important to leave some of that fruit and some of those vegetables to replenish the soil? Right. That's, that's why fruits and vegetables are so nutritious, right, is that they're taking nutrient out of the soil. And so I think that that's something that some people don't uh, understand. You know, participants of mine that take my workshops or they're like, my soil isn't good or I didn't have a really good garden. And then you ask, well, are you, you know, putting nutrients back into the soil every year? You know, because the reason that tomato is so nutritious is because it's taken nutrients out. So you have to understand that you have to replenish that in some way. So here's an example of someone on the street. And in our communities, that is a depletion uh, on many, many levels, emotionally, mentally, physically, monetarily. And as a culture, we haven't learned how to take care of everyone. Um, we need to first take care of ourselves and be our best so that we can connect to others in a really healthy, wholesome way. And we as a society have have so many disconnects in not taking care of not only ourselves but our environment and each other. And it's partly because of this compartmentalization of not realizing that we are all connected, that what we think, what we feel, what we do impacts not only um, each other but the entire planet the entire ecosystem, both on a human level and a planetary level. So if you're this woman who's exhausted and has a headache and is um, pushing herself by having another cup of coffee Mm -hmm. to keep going, you're out of sync with your own personal needs, which then transfers to everyone you interact with that day. So what does regulate and accept feedback look on personal level and on a relational level? Uh, When we don't regulate our energies and emotions, we deplete ourselves. Pushing when we need to rest really exhausts our system on all levels, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And then we are depleted, but then we are still expected to give to a family or give to our job. And that's just not possible. It isn't possible to keep pushing eventually it's an exhaustion and then you have sickness and disease, right? Mm -hmm. I know many people in my coaching industry that, you know, in working with clients over the years that 
they they use sickness as a way to set an indirect boundary. They mm-hmm. don't know how to modulate enough to say, no, I'm not able to take your kids for the weekend. They, they do it, and then they're exhausted on Monday morning. Mm-hmm. So part of regulating is regulating ourselves first, gaining insight by that observation piece and noting the feedback our bodies are giving us when we want to rest our bodies will tell us what we need when we're hungry when we need to get exercise when we're not moving enough a relationship itself cannot thrive without honoring each person so it doesn't mean being in competition with your spouse or your child or your co-worker it means finding a way to honor the needs of everyone honoring the timing of meetings, honoring the timing of, of dinner to coordinate with your child's soccer game or, or your husband's work when he works late. And so it's finding a way to create win-win across the entire uh, spectrum of relationship. Our actions determine the quality of our relationships. And when we act without our feedback, sometimes we're in reaction. But when your feedback tells you that there's something not working, it's usually not working. Mm-hmm. Instead of repeating that pattern, it means pausing and saying, okay, what just happened in that exchange with my wife or my husband? What just happened where I just yelled at my child? What's going on? If you do the feedback loop, you'll find that maybe you cut yourself sleep or you haven't eaten all day or there hasn't been enough self-care, so all of a sudden your child's behavior now becomes a problem rather than for you. Health and, and happiness in our relationships are essential feedback for self-correction. Mm-hmm. So if we're not paying attention to that, we're blaming someone else for the way we feel, then we're not taking responsibility for that feedback. When we don't adjust our actions, we bear the consequences. There's conflict in relationship. There's disconnection. There's distance. There's a lot of hurt. There's usually a lot of anger, and th- that just goes around. And I find that when we're on that wheel like a hamster running on the wheel and we just go faster and we don't step off that wheel, (laughs) we don't have the awareness and not paying attention. So we're not regulating. We're just going faster thinking it's going to change and it doesn't. Right. Right. So just to bring it back to uh, an ecological level, of course, is this understanding that we all live downstream uh, and that we are receiving feedback on an ecological level of what's not working. And when you're looking at your yard and garden, you'll receive that feedback of that plant is not thriving here. Does that mean that I have to change it? Does it need more fertility? Is it not in the right place? Um, So again, same kind of connections of observing Uh, and then being able to accept that feedback and then change our actions accordingly. So important. So another worksheet for you, um, again, to integrate uh, some of this material. Um, First of all, you know, understanding what are your patterns of self-care. So understanding, you know, do you get enough rest? Do you exercise? Are you interacting with the natural world? Uh, What's your diet like? Uh, do you push when you need to rest? Um, understanding, you know, and then what's the feedback you're currently getting from the people in your life? And it could all, not only be the people in your life, but that you're getting from yourself in terms of body breakdown mm-hmm. or, you know, Absolutely. stress mm-hmm. or any of those types of things. And the other reason we do these worksheets um, and for you to have some self reflection is that until you do that, there is no meaningful change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we don't stop long enough and really take time to ask these questions, we just keep going and doing what we've always done, right? But it also is is well documented and proven in the research around the brain is that the brain's always looking to do better, but it also is always looking to keep you safe. So if you're if you're stressed or you're in a, a real negative mood because you haven't exercised or you haven't um, been eating well, then the brain is going to start looking for the negatives mm-hmm. and it's going to start pointing out all the things that are wrong, which then makes you feel more bummed out and, you know, <laughs> like life is so hard and oh my Downward God. spiral. All right. You see, that's that downstream, right? Mm-hmm. So it all is connected. Mm-hmm. And so when you stop and you ask some of these questions, you, you, you sometimes have some real important awarenesses that will help you to do it differently so that you're more aligned with these principles and they the principles and the structure itself helps you and uh, invigorates you to do it differently 
great. So our third principle is integrate rather than segregate. I, I talked a little bit about this. Again, we are a reductionist society and we have a way of compartmentalizing things. Um, but of course, in the physical world, everything exists together, right? We think of the vegetable garden and the flower garden and the lawn and, you know, we, we, se we have a tendency to, to separate all of those things out. Um, but a bee or a butterfly doesn't know the difference. Yeah, um, that's for sure. And so you want to, say, on an ecological level, look for ways to connect elements in your system. So can the flower garden be integrated with the vegetable garden? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's better um, for the system. Uh, and then when they're correctly placed, each element supports one another, right? So that those flowers um, attract beneficial insects into your garden, right? They support the existing garden. They s attract pollinators that will pollinate not only your veggies, right? But they'll also pollinate the flowers. And then another thing to think about is it's not the number of elements in a system that makes it resilient, it's the number of relationships between them. So trying to make as many connections between different things in your yard, for example, um, makes it more of a resilient system. So for example, can you have your greenhouse connected to your garden? Uh, the greenhouse, not only within the greenhouse, you'll be growing out seedlings that you'll then put in your garden, so it'll be really close to your garden, but then the greenhouse creates a microclimate outside of it, and you can grow more hot crops in front of the greenhouse, right? So you're connecting those systems to make them together work Better. And so what you want to think about, again, where people are segregating all of their, the different elements of the yard, you really want to think of your yard as an ecosystem. Uh, and this is what I teach in my classes, right? Everything is connected. So that if you do have a pest in your system, it's not just about that pest that's come into your system, right? It's that something in your ecosystem, the yard of your ecosystem is out of balance. Uh, it doesn't mean that you need to plant more flowers to attract beneficial insects. Is something wrong with the soil? Do you need to provide more nutrient for the soil? Um, so begin to think of your yard as an ecosystem. And I think those pests, some of those pests are, those are the reminders to us that we're not paying attention, right? Absolutely. <laughs> right. It gets back to that feedback loop, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So integrate in our relationships. It's really the connection between us that nurtures and sustains the ecosystem of a family or a community. And I think we forget this, that it's not in the people that is our true resource. It's in the relationships that build the resiliency, like you're saying, Corinne. And so in how it relates to our human relationships and being, whether it's your love relationship or whether it's at work and interacting with your boss or your coworkers or you have a business on your own, it's always seek to unify, mm -hmm. seek to connect with yourself, others, and nature. It is in protection and survival that we want to segregate and separate out because we're in protection, we're not feeling safe, so the brain naturally wants to protect us, and so it's in fight, flight, or freeze. And so the goal then is to always be, remain open and curious so that you can regain your balance and connect to your heart. Take time for introspection and applying insights you receive without slowing things down and having that observation, we can't do this, and it's really, how you make those more mindful and revel in your successes or take time to observe something that gives you a delight is really how the meaning creates a, a more rich and fulfilling life. So it's really important in the integration process to celebrate some of the things that we've accomplished or the wonderful exchange we just had with our teenager. It, it's putting the attention on those that creates the connection that we're after. The goal is to join with others without giving up ourselves and what is important to us. One of the greatest travesties as well as challenges in relationship is there's a lot of compliancy and there's a lot of myths that say that we must compromise in order to mm. have connection and relationship or have a good, solid relationship. And it's just not true. It's, um, it's actually in seeking what is best for all of us, first with ourselves and knowing what's important to us, and, and giving voice to that so that we can actually 
not only us receive that, but it becomes then a, a synergy between us and others and what they want. And then you create a greater, more um, enriched experience with the we. Hmm. What is the we look? That will look different than me versus you. And so we just haven't been taught how to do this, and that is in the integration piece. Nice, nice. Time for workshop. <laughs> worksheet. Worksheet number four. So the this worksheet uh, is, again, um, related to integrating, no pun intended, integrating the, uh, the material. So we want you to think of one relationship where you feel distant and unappreciated. And what specifically about this relationship makes you feel this way? Again, drawing attention to and really taking some time to think about um, what that is. And then you want, you want to think about a relationship where you feel connected and valued and what specifically about this relationship makes you feel connected. So one of the things that's nice about this is contrast. Um, if you've ever noticed your mind, it's always comparing, always going sorting, black and white, cold and hot, and that's the way it's constructed. And so sometimes when you look at the negative and the positive, it's, it's easier to assimilate what you actually want to apply. Um, it's not an accident that the people that you feel best with and that you are feel closest to, that it will have certain ingredients that create that healthy, thriving relationship. And the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. So please take some time now and do this worksheet. And I think one thing that's interesting, too, is if you can cultivate these relationships and create more beneficial relationships, right, overall, that's a healthier, you know, community. Mm -hmm. And it nurtures us. And as nurtures well. us. Mm -hmm. And it's a healthier community. And uh, I not only do I teach workshops on gardening, but I also do potlucks once a month uh, during the growing season. And it's just an opportunity to bring a lot of people together. And I do make that connection um, that in in an ecosystem, right, it's the relationships between all the plants uh, that make it resilient. Um, but we also want to look at those beneficial networks that we create within within the people, um, within our communities. And so what I encourage is for people to introduce themselves and to um, connect with one another and to make both an offer and an ask. Uh, to the group. So if they have something to offer. In practice. Right. right. <laughs> if they, yeah, if they have something to offer, you know, it, maybe it's, you know, free plants or it's manure or, you know, right. whatever it is, then they put that out there. But if they need something from people, um, whether it's, um, you know, help in the garden or whether, you know, who knows what it might be. But then I've just seen just in that space of creating that space for people that there are all, all these connections that are being made and people walk away um, with oftentimes, you know, new friends um, and new people to turn to um, when they need certain resources. And it's wonderful because we often, we love giving. Right. Sometimes we have a difficult time receiving. Yes. And so it's also practice for that. And, and it isn't it in the flow of that, both of those, even in the ecosystem that is necessary for resiliency, right? Right. Right. I mean, again, you have plants within a system that uh, build up soil and build soil fertility and give it to the other plants, right? Which support them in some other way. Maybe they provide shade um, or, you know, so there are these give and take situations within, uh, again, an ecological garden um, that are very similar to what we'd find in our relationships. And when we, one of the things I, I read recently is that a grove of aspen trees mm. will sometimes, individual trees will allow another tree to have more water in the water system and the root system and they're all con combined and joined right i think we forget that we see these trees and we think they're separate and they don't have an interconnectedness and that was so heartwarming for me to realize that even at that level there is interconnectedness and sharing right and if you think about the level of the mycelium or the fungi that exist below in the soil and those connections it is it's like an interconnected web you know, it's the first internet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, the, the, we don't know what we don't know when it comes to natural mm -hmm. systems and the ways that they're communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, again, that 
that understanding that it's all connected is really I think hard for us to assimilate because we've lived in such a compartmentalized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reality. Right, and I think it really is helps us to realize that we are connected. Right, maybe people wouldn't feel so alone if they understood really what this is all about. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's you know oftentimes that's oftentimes why I I say natural systems rather than nature, right? Because when we say nature we've somehow, somehow disconnected ourselves from oh, nature oh, and we are nature I like that correction right mm -hmm. we are nature and i think that like you said you know when you learn about mm -hmm. all of these different systems or the aspen or the mycelium or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. i mean not only is it inspiring but it does make you think okay those patterns that we see in nature we also see them reflected in mm -hmm. our bodies right? right same systems right yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So moving on, uh, the fourth principle is produce no waste. Um, so in ecological systems, there is no waste. A waste becomes a resource for something else. And so nothing is wasted uh, in those systems. And if you can recognize that a waste can be a resource, um, in your garden, right? That those leaves, that instead of raking them to the side of the road for the city to pick up, right? Those leaves are actually a great resource. You can use them to mulch your garden. You can use them to build a compost pile. So what you want to do in the design of your yards um, is to create as many closed loops as possible, right? So that you're, you're growing your tomato, you're eating your tomato, the, the, the leftovers or, or whatever that you don't eat or the plant itself gets recycled back into the system, right? You're not throwing and exporting that, you're not throwing that in the garbage and putting that in a landfill, you're actually putting that nutrient back into your garden. Because um, what inevitably ends up happening, or I've seen this again, you rake your leaves to the side and then you buy some mulch from elsewhere. Right. So and it, and I understand that aesthetically, you know, the, that beautiful cedar mulch mm -hmm. is much better than leaves. Right. Um, but it's just that whole understanding that we're exporting a lot off of our property and importing other things. And what you want to do and work towards over time is exporting less and less and importing less and less so that you're providing more um, for yourself. Far more sustainable. Right. Right. So, for example, in our system, we are, say, importing a bunch of stuff to begin with to get things established, but there are things like wood chip, there are things like manure, things like um, straw, things that are actually waste products on for someone else, mm -hmm. right? right? And we're connecting them to our system, and they become resources for us. But then in addition to that, then I'm putting in plants that give fertility, mm -hmm. right? That build fertility in the soil, or I'm, I'm growing um, crops that could be part of a compost system. So as the system evolves on my property, I will have to bring in less and less inputs over time. So again, by putting the right things in the right place, relationships develop between those systems and they support each other. So one example is a, say for example, an, uh, a factory farm. So you have all of these cows in the system and their manure becomes a liability, mm. right? Oh, yeah. It's a huge liability in a factory system like that because you have a ton of manure that you have to get rid of in some way. Or dog poop, depending on the right. ecosystem. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, if you connected that, if it was more of an ecological system, then, of course, the scale would be smaller. You'd have less less cows, but then those cows, their poop would go back into the pastures that would feed the cows, mm -hmm. right? So it becomes a closed-loop system. And it is. I don't know how many people every year in my workshops are like, do you have a good source for manure? Like gardeners are looking for poop all the time, right? <laughs> and then you have farmers <laughs> over <laughs> here that are like, I don't know where what to, to do get. With all I this, don't know yeah. what to get do with all of this. So if you can design systems um, that look at those wastes, so-called wastes in a system, and can put them back into um, a resource, that's what you want to work towards. 
Nature operates according to a system of nutrients and metabolic metabolism metabolism there's that word in which there is no such thing as waste waste equals food so how would it be so much different if we live this principle mm -hmm. you know if everything that we created in our environment was safe was nutritious even mm -hmm. instead of having so much waste we have not figured out what nature and natural systems already have right 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 so how does this relate to relationships. What we don't care for becomes waste. So just like when you don't take care of your um, garbage and you don't take your garbage out or it becomes like what you're saying is it, it, just it's exported out for someone else, it's someone else's problem in the landfill, right? Mm -hmm. um, that happens in relationship too. If we don't care for relationships, if we don't nurture them, then there's a lot more problems that ensue as a result, which waste resources, uh, whether it's in a divorce that costs a lot of money, whether it is, you know, with a behavioral problem that wastes our time and our energy, um, and the child misses out on drop skills and um, information and development that they need. Um, when we care for things, it just doesn't happen. There isn't waste. Um, and there really isn't any waste in terms of emotions or painful experiences. Our painful experiences from our past are really meant to be composted in much the way you're talking about mm -hmm. with manure. They're, they're there to, to heal us and to teach us what we need to develop, what skills we lack, um, using that for compost to become a greater person and have more um, stability in our character. And, and so we can always learn and grow, but we've, again, separated that out as a problem rather than integrate it into this is the human experience and what do we do with it, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so it's become this something separate from us rather than pain is part of the human experience and what's the experience you want to create from it. Well, it makes me also think about, so you have you know, a bunch of kitchen waste and kitchen scraps and then you integrate them into a compost pile and that compost pile cooks over time, mm -hmm. right? Right. And then it becomes this amazing nutrient mm -hmm. right. for your soil. And that's really what's happening for us. We're cooking those emotions that are so um, profound and deep and painful, yes, are cooking us into our finer self if we allow it. But what we do is resist it and separate out from it in protection. And in doing that, we've isolated ourselves from ourselves. Right. Right, and so our hearts are shut down, and then that disconnects from each other. And that, again, a perfect thing about compost. If you don't do it right, that's great. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't then work. Then it stinks. <laughs> it not only stinks, it, but it doesn't work. It right? doesn't work. It goes anaerobic. <laughs> it stinks, and it putrefies. Oh, really? Right. And it's not good for the soil. And then. it's not good for the soil. Right. And so what that happens in pain with relationships, too. If we carry our past pain into a relationship, it, it becomes the same experience. Right. Uh, productivity can deplete us when it is a substitute for caring for ourselves and others. Uh, many times, I mean, endorphins and, and different chemicals are released, feel-good drugs when we check something off our to-do list. So productivity can be a real mm -hmm. positive mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But if we overdo, then it depletes us. If we make getting something done more important than quality time with each other, it starts depleting us. Everything should nourish everything else. So mm -hmm. what we are doing and being and feeling and saying those words that come from our mouth should nurture rather than destroy. And so, again, if we're taking care of ourselves, if we're observing ourselves and what's going on internally, we will take time to exercise when we're feeling out of sorts and then by doing that then we can come home and be fully present uh, to those around us if we're learning to convert our painful experiences to compost we take time to figure out what we need um, the conversations that can be difficult are sometimes what create the greatest intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. but when we're just busy checking things off our list and we're not paying attention, we're not paying attention to the feedback that we get from other people, then we just create more and more waste. Time for the worksheet. <laughs> so another worksheet. And again, we didn't mention this before, but feel free to, you know, 
pause this webinar and be able to take some time um, to integrate these and, and answer these questions. Um, so the two questions that we have related to, to produce no waste are where are you producing waste in your life? Um, whether it's uh, wasting time, money, food, energy. Um, and then what is one small action you can take to produce less waste? Now, sometimes I've noticed that with more knowledge and more awareness, mm -hmm. we tend to beat ourselves up when we see more things that we could be doing or should be doing, we should on ourselves. And so it's really critical to have some gentleness and compassion for yourself. Um, when I was a young mother with three children that were small, and I had this fr friend or acquaintance that was a major recycler. Um, <laughs> she was just uh, totally fanatic about it. And uh, I just... Frankly, I didn't have the energy um, mm -hmm. to even consider recycling. And I remember one time she got on my case because I was throwing away the, the tubes for the toilet paper. And I was like, really? Are you kidding? <laughs> I could barely keep up with laundry, let alone meals and, mm -hmm. and going to soccer games and, and basketball games and all the rest that go with family. And mm -hmm. we also have to be merciful and kind with ourselves and realizing that um, it is a progression of learning and um, growing up inside and learning how to care for ourselves is the first prerequisite for caring for our environment. Mm -hmm. And so caring for ourselves is a first priority. And then as you care for yourself and learn to love yourself, you it automatically translates as caring for the environment and for those around us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we want you just to take one small action because I think you know, everything that's going on in the world, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. It is. Mm -hmm. And I think that oftentimes people think, well, one small thing is not going to make much of a difference, so I'm just not going to do anything at all, right? right? Mm -hmm. Or it's just too overwhelming to know where to start uh, mm -hmm. because there are, there are 50 things that you could possibly do to mm -hmm. make the world better. Uh, and so I think it is to be gentle on ourselves on the one hand, but also to identify one thing that you can do mm -hmm. um, because there are simple things that you can, maybe it is that you recycle. Mm -hmm. right? right. Or that you sign up for a recycling service. Right. You know, maybe it is that you start to compost or mm -hmm. maybe it is that you have a garden. You know, any of those things kind of step you um, in in a direction where you are taking care of yourself more and you're taking care mm -hmm. of the planet. And it really isn't, you know, less is more is truly uh, true. Um, one of the things that is really imperative that everybody gets is that a small action affects everything else. Right. You know, everything's connected. So if you just take one small action, but you're doing it day after day, it is going to change the responses to you. It will be changing your brain, how you feel about yourself. You'll feel more confident that you're actually taking action. Mm -hmm. But typically we take too big leaps and too much action that we don't sustain. So if you do something, you know, for a day and then don't do it for a week, it really doesn't make any permanent change. Right. What we want to do is take it small enough and choose wisely so that we can actually keep it in our lives long enough to be able to for the brain to take it serious and for it to actually transform us. Right, right. And I think of that even in terms of recommending to my clients uh, or people to, that take my workshops to start small with a garden. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, because definitely people come to the workshops, they're all excited, oh, and they're no. like, I'm going to have a 300-square-foot <laughs> garden. And I, I try to walk them <laughs> back a little bit and just say, you know, you want to grow into your garden. You want to see how much time it takes you. You want to, you know, have small successes rather than epic failures, because I think mm -hmm. what ends up happening a lot is that people kind of aim high, and they want to do all of these things, or they mm -hmm. want to make all of these changes, right, right. and then they walk away. Mm -hmm. You because know, it's just too because much. it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that that connection to just having a small garden, maybe it's like a four by eight raised bed. Mm -hmm. If you're successful with that, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, Yeah, I learned that lesson in high school. I um, had this, um, I worked at a nursing home and 
I was I was really um, sad at the quality of their food, right? So I got this big idea. They had this empty lot next to it, and so I got this big idea. I was going to create this big garden. Oh my for gosh! Them. Yeah, they could work in it, and yeah. I could get this fresh food. And yeah. so it was way more. It was like a oh, quarter of an acre, and I was like out there tilling and and rototilling. And by the time I got that plan, I was like, oh my god, what have I bitten <laughs> off? It was just so much. I mean, it was way too much. Right. And um, didn't have the ownership and agreement of that they actually wanted to help either right. Right? so it fell on me so small is big right right absolutely so our final principle is respond to change and this gets right into what you just said jennifer using small and slow solutions again there is this kind of go big or go home mentality yeah. that's been part of our culture uh, that we've been socialized that you got to, you know, if you're going to start a business, you need to take out a $300,000 loan and right. you got to, you know, build it and expand and expand and expand. And again, that's that kind of system that's gotten us uh, into the, the, the place that we're in right now. Um, so you want to, you know, the, the principle in ecology is being able to set up a system where you can creatively respond to change um, because the only thing that is certain in this life is that things are changing. Um, so you want to deepen your awareness of the ecosystem. That's where that observation piece comes in. You want to en enhance those connections between different elements in your system. Uh, you want to build um, reserves of energy and you want to ultimately cultivate a greater capacity um, to, to be able to respond to change when it comes. And I think um, when you look at right now, you know, the planet is responding to change. Um, the planet has a fever, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And it's trying to respond to that change. So we can do that um, on a very, like on a micro scale in our, our yards and gardens by creating these resilient networks. Um, by observing and understanding what's going on, by building soil fertility, by bringing in beneficial insects and pollinators into your yards so that when there's a drought, right, or when um, there's, you know, some, a pest, right, we can respond to that change accordingly. So can't <clears throat> reinforce it enough, small is big. <laughs> Grow your self-awareness and practice being true to yourself. And this, again, can be as, as small as just asking what you need in any given moment, right? Um, throughout the day, asking, okay, what do I need right, right this moment? Mm -hmm. and, and then giving it to yourself. It doesn't take a vacation in Hawaii for a week to mm -hmm. renew ourselves. Right. Sometimes it's stepping outside and breathing in or looking at a flower or looking and, and reveling in the smile of your child. It, it's really the small things that make a big difference. And it requires us sharpening their awareness of that and mm -hmm. practicing being kind to one another and to ourselves. Build trust and personal reserves as well as reserves in your relationships. It's having those reserves. Think of a time when you really taken care of yourself. You had lots of sleep and great food and you had social interactions with friends that you love. You have um, great uh, ability to really take time and have mindfulness. How you respond to something is so much different than when you're harried and ex you know totally exhausted stressed about work, about the bills getting paid, your reactions are going to be very different. Mm -hmm. So those reserves allow us both physically, mentally, emotionally, and relationally to be able to be kinder to ourselves. Invest in each other and nurture yourself, your relationships, and your environment. It takes time to invest. Mm -hmm. Investments grow, but we don't always see it up front. It's in those tiny little moments that really make the difference and become a linchpin for everything else to happen in our interconnectedness. Mm. So we have a last worksheet for you um, related to this principle. Um, so these questions, what gifts did the last big change in your life give you? Um, I think we oftentimes don't ever want to think of it that way, especially if it's a mm -hmm. change that, you know, we resist it's hard change. hard to receive, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We resist change. And so to look at, you know, the positive 
things that came out of that mm -hmm. um, big change mm -hmm. um, are really important. And, uh, and to feed off of that, uh, one of the things with the brain is the, one of the reasons we don't like change and we resist change is because the brain doesn't like change necessarily. It needs to know that something is repeatable and survivable. Mm -hmm. And so something's new. If you've never experienced it, you've never done it, you don't, the brain doesn't know that. Right. So it's also, again, being gentle and compassionate, realizing that any growth area any is going to be uncomfortable. Right. And that any change is initially going to feel sometimes even painful. Right. Um, but it's also looking for um, having stability. So when you're faced with great changes in your life or even small changes and it shakes your world, stop and say, what is one thing I could do to give myself more stability? How can I regain my balance in this moment? Or how can I reframe the way I'm looking at this change so that I actually feel better about it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, again, it's not what happens, it's how we're perceiving it that creates the stress. Right. And it makes me think about another ecological principle around optimizing edges. You know, they, the quote is, the edge is where the action is. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, productivity in an, in an ecological system, right, is usually along the edge. Mm -hmm. You think about where do you fish? Well, along the edges of a lake, hmm. right? Um, or where are the where is there the most um, diversity of species? Well, it's between the forest and the grassland. Hmm. So, because that along that edge, you have the species that exist both in the forest and the grassland, and you have the species that exist along the edge. So, change makes us more diverse, right? And well, and I think that it it um, inspires you in terms mm -hmm. of it inspires you to action potentially, mm -hmm. right? Right. That there's there's a lot of good. There's productivity at that edge, at that edge of change, that there's a lot that if you can look at it in a way that's that might not be um, that's not negative. Right? right. It's an opportunity. Right. To be our best self. Right. Right. So our conclusion. Right. Our conclusion is, so on an ecological level, this whole idea of interconnectedness, um, that if you have healthy soil, right? You create and grow healthy plants and you create and grow healthy people. You know, that the nutrient in the soil will be in the plants and then you eat those, th those vegetables and you become healthy yourself. And loving and nurturing actions helps us be happy people. That creates healthy relationships. And just sort of review, the five principles that we've gone over, um, basically ways to create not only healthy ecosystems on a, on a landscape level, but healthy ecosystems on a relationship level. Uh, so again, observe and interact with your environment. Uh, look at your patterns of self-care. Um, observe your relationships with others. Um, Self-regulate and accept feedback integrate rather than segregate, um, create community, create beneficial relationships, mm -hmm. produce no waste, and respond to change. So with knowledge, it's awesome to expand our knowledge, but knowledge without action it amounts to nothing. So we want to make sure that you're applying uh, what you're learning. So I'd like you just to think about what is one thing that you could commit to today that will uplift you or your family or your lifestyle? Just one small action that you're willing to commit to. Give some thought to that because it's in that decision to commit that actually allows us to move forward. Okay. And so we just wanted to end with this quote, personal relationships are the fertile soil from which all advancement, all success, all achievement in real life grows. Uh, it really is interesting, you know, how we have been kind of disconnected from um, from our environment, and yet we see a lot of the the verbiage mm -hmm. in what we use a lot: plant a seed, right? right? Mm -hmm. Fertile soil. Right. You know, we are we are connected or we used to be connected mm -hmm. to those agricultural terms right, right? When we lived on, on and right mm -hmm. when we were homesteaders or whatever right. mm -hmm. when we related more to right. what that meant right, right? Um, so it's interesting that it, it does 
no pun intended again, crop up <laughs> in, in, you know, different quotations that we have or our language. Uh, yeah, it's, it's integrated into our very language. <laughs> That's right. And yet we're not, we don't have as much awareness about it anymore. So what, what's next? We, we want you to take that commitment, make that commitment uh, to a small action uh, that will make a big difference in your life. Um, but if you want to continue to learn with um, each of us, we have a couple opportunities out there for you. So uh, if you want to learn more about designing your yard and garden and creating that ecosystem, then I do have uh, an online edible backyard series. So again, it's an opportunity to, to, to design your yard. I take you through three modules uh, where I teach you how to design your edible landscape. Uh, module two, I teach you how to build healthy soil. And then module three, I talk about vegetable growing, growing fruit. Uh, so I get more into the nuts and bolts of that. Um, so this online edible backyard series includes 14 training videos that cover the course topics. It has worksheets uh, somewhat similar to what we went through in this webinar, um, and then activities that would make it specific to your site. And then lastly, there is a private forum um, where you can go to answer questions. Uh, so if you want more information about that, you can go to my online course platform called Broken, uh, which is at brokenground.teachable.com. One of the easiest ways to reconnect back to natural systems is to have a garden. Oh, for sure. You know, and I think that, you know, even for people that don't have a backyard or don't have space, you know, I, I encourage them to grow things in containers. Mm -hmm. Even growing, I had a college kid, you know, the other day, be like, what's one thing that I can do? You know, I live in an apartment, you know, and I'm like, take a pot, grow some lettuce, you know, or grow some kale. And I saw him not too long ago, he's like, Kareem, they're growing, you know. <laughs> and I think it's just that excitement that you feel. Gets you started. Right, that, that understanding that you can plant a seed and then watch it grow and then you can eat it. That's something that unfortunately we've lost that connection and people get inspired um, by being able to do that again. And they reconnect to it. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if you want to connect with me for coaching opportunities, my email address is here. And you have uh, Corrine's address as well. So thank you so very much for taking this your precious time to be with us. And I hope it was helpful and that you enjoyed it. Yes, please be in touch if you have any follow-up questions or if you want to uh, connect with us in other ways. Thanks so much, and we hope to connect with you soon.